every time that theme plays, I feel like a cross between Austin Powers and James Bond. You know, it's it's a great theme. It really is. But it it, give, it makes me laugh every time it plays. It's a great theme from iMovie. Anyway, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 157 of the Mike the New Haven podcast. If you have not checked out episode 156, that was volume eight of another mini series we have on this show excuse me, titled The E-Men Inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. But what was interesting is I actually interviewed an E-woman. She was one of the first females in the emergency service unit. Her name was Madeline Lawrence. She worked in Truck 8 in Brooklyn for many, many years, and she was great to talk to. A lot of rescues she did. Of course, she talked about being at Ground Zero after 9-11 and, and all the humorous things that come from being in ESU, including an incident with snakes in the late 90s. Uh, so if you haven't checked out that episode, please do. So we shift from the E-Men Inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit to the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. Now, normally we profile retired firefighters for this mini series, but tonight we had a little interesting twist because when you read the stories of these firemen, really firefighters, I should say female and male, doing these incredible things, who's getting the message out there? Well, the press office of the FDNY. It's a pivotal function that they have in showcasing this work so, though, so that we don't forget, especially in a city like New York, what these men and women do day in and day out. And my next guest is a woman who recently switched places from the uh, newsroom of uh, New York One to the press room of the FDNY. The daughter and brother of a firefighter, or excuse me, sister of a firefighter. Uh, that would serve her well in her career. She's a 2001 graduate of Fordham University, as well as a 2010 graduate of Baruch College. She was a staple on New York One News for 20 years, uh, beginning in September of 2000 up until the end of 2020. And recently she became the first female press secretary and FDNY history. And that for volume 13 of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite is FDNY press secretary, Amanda Farinacci. Amanda, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to be here. It's nice to have you. So I believe you grew up on Staten Island, rich history in the fire service with your father. being a fire Yes. Man? Yes. Actually, I grew up in Brooklyn, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and bad. then like so many others, I found myself um, Staten Island. I haven't yet made my way to New Jersey or to Florida as, as is the common pathway. But yeah, um, my dad is retired for some time now, but um, he worked in ladder 148. He worked in ladder 132. Um, when <laughs> I was a kid, he retired just before 9-11, um, which was actually a godsend because um, if he had not retired, he would be dead. His um, whole group was working on 9-11, and it was only a matter of months when he had um, retired until 9-11 uh, happened. So a um, lot of stuff to unpack there. But um, certainly the fire department has been a long uh, and storied part of my personal life. It's, it's, it's just like the blood of, you know, everybody, in my, it's in the blood of everybody in my family, not to sound too cliche, but like, um, it's just, it's everywhere I turn. And now I live on Staten Island, which we know is like a huge, um, home to first responders. So it's like, not just what's happening in my, in my immediate nuclear, you know, my family, it's also, you know, all the people I know who, who I'm friends with, who, who's on the department in that respect, whatever. So the small, the wor world is very small for me in that no, regard. Of course. Of course, that borough, I mean, you, we probably know a lot of the same people from both the PD and the FD that live out there because of that very reason. It is where a lot of the first responders live. I mean, it's easier because, I mean, the chaos of the city can be a lot, especially if you're working in it. So Staten Island's the quieter borough, you know, and I, I imagine it's peaceful these days for you out there. At least I hope it is. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I was in uh, when I was after college, I lived in the city for a little while. I lived in Stye Town and I, and I was, I'm always grateful that I did that to have had that experience to not be on Staten Island and just have that be the sort of end of, you know, graduate, go to school and then just be on Staten Island for your whole life. I, I had other experiences, which I, you know, I, I always like laugh to people. Like I grew up in, in Brooklyn. I moved, lived on Staten Island. I went to college in the Bronx at Fordham and, um, you know, and I lived in Manhattan and I worked in Manhattan. The only borough I've got real no attachment to is Queens. And honestly, that's my least favorite borough. Sorry to all the Queens people, but that's, that's just me being honest. I'm, I'm always confused by the road, the street, the place, the yacht. Like I, I can never, it's not my place to navigate. Um, I have a lot of respect for people who live there, but it's not my place. I like the Rockaways well, the beach. I do like the beach and the airport well, getting out of town. <laughs> right. <laughs> Queens gave us, to be fair, though, Queens did give us Nas and Mob Deep. So, you know, it's not all bad from Queens. And, you know, no. Staten Island did give us the Wu-Tang Clan, so they this, might have the edge there. You know, true. so <laughs> this is this is it's volume true. 13 of the best, the bravest interviews with the FDNY's lead. Our guest tonight is FDNY Press Secretary Amanda Farinacci. So when I always ask this to the people that come from a journalistic background, you know, for you, when would you say you first took an interest in journalism? Uh, I was a junior at Fordham University and I was looking for um, 
you know, I wasn't really 100% sure what I wanted to do. I was looking for an internship. And um, as is always the case, it's a matter of who you know, and who knows somebody who can help you do um, what you want. So I always tell people who are like younger, and when they're in school, you know, it, that is really worth it to make the kinds of relationships where you can advance, you know, where there's something in it for you. But also like, if you know somebody who does something that you want to do, spend time with that person. Um, as I said, my dad was a retired firefighter. And um, he worked with someone who was best friends with a reporter named Scott Weinberger at News Channel 4 at the time. Scott was the investigative reporter. Well, actually, I think he was the Queens reporter for that time and eventually became an investigative reporter and then went to CBS. And now he's got his own production company. So um, Scott was friends with someone who was really good friends with my dad. And he said, OK, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll meet with her. It's fine. And the minute I walked into the newsroom, I felt like, OK, that's it. This is it. This is what I want to do. I've always had um, a passion for um, writing. I... Um, <clears throat> even just like, you know, therapeutic kind of whatever, but I'm, I'm a very, um, like visually, I like to describe things in my, in, I like to describe the things I see in my head. So storytelling is very easy. It's always like writing stuff and storytelling has always been very easy for me. And I'm a big believer that if you um, are passionate about what you like to do, and if you think it's fun, it will always stay fun and passionate and your job will always be easy. We'll never feel like work. And um, so I had that as an, when I met with Scott, that was one option. The other option that I contemplated was um, going to intern for a judge, um, like a, a clerk in a judge's office. Um, and that didn't work out. And I wound up actually taking the LSAT um, but right, right before, or I'm sorry, right after 9-11, because I kind of still thought that I wanted to go to law school, but I just didn't have the head for it because I'd had a somewhat traumatic 9-11 experience. And I just felt like, um, you know, I've always had like a, a real obligation, I think. I've always felt a real obligation to public service and to telling stories and advocating and stuff like that. And reporting seemed more, um, of a, it seemed like a more immediate thing for, way for me to, at, especially at that time around 9-11, for me to, to sort of give people a voice that um, hadn't had an opportunity to have one previously. I want to take it back for a second to that time, I guess, both at Fordham and NBC, because you walk into that NBC newsroom, 1998, 1999, Darlene Rodriguez, who's still there to this day, she's there. Chuck Scarborough, same thing, uh, he's there. Pat Harper, Linda Beccaro, the list goes on of these people who have had such distinguished careers and are well known. You know, even if you're not having that much interaction with them as an intern, the intern position in anywhere is the ultimate case of getting to be the fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. So just by sheer observation, what would you say was the most important thing you learned early on that you felt helped guide you later on as you ascended in your own career? Um, shut up. I would say shut up um, and watch. Um, I feel like I had such an, first of all, I, I, I was the intern that sort of never left. I'm not sure that they've had an intern as long as me even since. And I have a lot of friends who still work there. Um, I came in the summer of 99. I stayed through the spring of 2000, um, I was there. I was in the NBC newsroom um, the night when there was the switch from 1999 to 2000 because they wanted extra bodies and that, you know, God forbid the world ended. Um, I was there on the assignment desk. Obviously things were okay. Um, but I, I, I think the biggest lesson and even something that's kind of missing now just in my experience with um, interns currently is when I was an intern, I was so aware of my place. Um, I was so aware of the idea that um, I should, I should really just kind of observe and try and, and, and notice people's techniques and why do you do this and why do you do that? But I didn't really, um, say a lot unless I was asked for input because I felt like my job was really to learn. And I feel like there's a little shift in that where, um, I've had interns, I've interacted with interns who are very like, put me on camera or can I do that? You know, who are very forward, which is, which is actually probably a benefit at this point, um, for, you know, instead of like being a wallflower, but I do think, that there's a huge benefit in, in doing it the other way, because that's where you really can pick up. You hone your observation skills. Um, you have like deep conversations with people who are probably really happy and passionate about what they're doing. And they want to tell you, how do you do this? Well, you know, when you watch, when you show, uh, roll up to like a scene, you're, it's your job to notice the detail that other people don't. And sometimes you have to be quiet to do that. You know, there's, there's some, um, there's something, there's some treasure in that not being, you know, the chatterbox or whatever. And so I would say to most people, if, if you are in that position um, and you're lucky enough to be an intern someplace, <clears> your, <throat> your observation skills are really the most important thing. That's what you should really be. It's really just like watch, obviously if you have an opportunity to do things, you should do that as well. But um it's really like a treasure to just kind of sit back and watch and learn. 
And that's kind of the same technique I apply to these interviews because, you know, the key for me, like I grew up listening to Mike Francesa and I love Mike Francesa, but the guy, it sounded like he was almost interviewing himself, you know, whenever he would have a guest on. And it, and it made me cringe because for that, as you said, you know, the best thing you can do is really just zip your lips, you know, to where in my technique, okay, let him talk. You might pick up on something. Maybe you can ask a question you didn't think of asking before. You don't have to show them that you know what you're talking about. You're, you're, the questions you ask over the course of the interview will prove that to be true. So, I mean, it's a technique that applies not just to the newsroom, but really to all different respects. And there's something that Ashley Banfield told me when she was on the show a while ago, which is and the exact quote is, and it made me laugh at the time. It makes me laugh now. If I could be myself again, I would shut the hell up and go <laughs> to that stage in her life, you know, because it was the same thing. So I guess in, in that same vein, you look at Fordham, even if you didn't go into the broadcasting program right away, I mean, I've covered this before with other guests. You look at the history of, of the Fordham alum that have gone on to do great things in broadcasting. It's evident throughout New York City. You think about Charles Osgood. You think about Vin Scully. I mean, I interviewed Alice Gaynor a little while ago. She's a Fordham girl. Of course, Michael Kay, the Yankees announcer, Mike Breen. So in that vein, you've uh, since ascended to the same status. And of course, you enjoyed a great career for many years in news. What can you say about Fordham's journalistic program? Because it's so unique and not just who it's produced, but the stepping stone being, of course, WFUV. Yeah. Um, well, actually, so I didn't I didn't do WFUV, but I did do the RAM. I was the copy editor of the Fordham RAM, which is the newspaper. Um, and that was fun. It was just a lot of fun. Um, it was it was my first experience. You know, at the same time I was working at the RAM, I was interning at WNBC. So I had kind of two converse experiences, one where I was spending time in a, in a television newsroom with this rapid pace and it's, you know, turn out a package every single day. And on the other side, at the end of the week, on Thursday nights, we went to print. And so there was the expectation that everybody was going to be in the basement of um, the McGinley Center uh, until seven o'clock in the morning, putting the paper to bed. And obviously, you're the copy editor. You're the person who's like reading line by line to make sure um, grammar and, you know, things that make sense the way they need to article placement and things like that. So that was like a, a lot of fun. Um, I was able to at that time, it was the first time I wrote a column that was published that had been published anywhere and across the campus. Um, and I, I found a lot of joy in that. And and I still do. And I think that, um, you know, and I always joke to people, even in my job that I the job that I have now that um, at, at my at my heart, I am like the grammar police or, you know, because I was a copy editor for so long. And I really think that words matter and like the way you use them really matters. And like a beautiful sentence is not a small thing. It's it's you know, if, if you write something and it's really well written, it really has the power to like you just quoted Ashley Banfield. Right. Like that's an, an amazing um, talent and and gift to have the ability to say something that resonates for someone that they keep it with them in their pocket and it becomes something they fall back on and becomes part of their language of what they're talking about in their life. And I don't think um, and I think that was probably the, the best part of what I learned in my experience with the RAM. Um, I think that at the time, because I was interning, and this is going to sound a little like, like I'm, maybe I'm rolling my eyes. I think I thought I don't need to do WFUV because I'm I'm working at News Channel Four. Like I'm already in the newsroom. I don't need to go to, um, you know, like college um, radio or whatever. So, um, but I would say I mean I took a lot of communication classes when I was there. I was at Rose Hill, as I said, and. Um, the campus there is wonderful because you're in New York City. Like I lived on Staten Island, but I was able to be on my own without really being far away, which I think is a huge asset for somebody in college, right? Like you're able to go home <laughs> minutes if you time it the right way, an hour, do your laundry, eat dinner with your family, and then go back to school and feel like you're, you know, you've had time away and, but you don't really have to miss home that much, but you've got the whole city at your disposal. And and you mentioned the network of alumnus, like it's, there's so many opportunities and, and um, you know, networking and uh, people that you meet and you know people think when you when you say you went to Fordham they're like oh I know somebody you went to that's a good school and and you know it's it's just fun it was just I had a really great time Fordham was a really great time for me absolutely Amanda Farinacci is your guest tonight on the Mike the New Haven podcast this is volume 13 of the best of the bravest interviews with the FTNY's elite shout out to our friends in the live chat real quick Raquel Pranzo and Peter Pranzo Peter of course retired NYPD lieutenant of street crime fame and an author to Raquel his better half and Bill Ryan retired NYPD first grade detective from the arson and explosion squad Bill of course he hates when I say this but I don't care he's the co-executive producer and co-creator with me of one of the mini series we have on this show tales from the boom room profiles of the NYPD's arson explosion and bomb squad, of course, which soon will hit its 20th volume. So thank you, Bill. Uh, continuing on, you know, um, 2000, you get to New York one 
And what's interesting is that around that time, it's not like Channel 4, not that I'm knocking uh, New York 1, it's not like other stations. It's still a relatively new station. It only started eight years prior in 1992. So it's less than a decade old when you get there. Given that, you know, sometimes when you walk into the CBS Broadcast Center, when you walk into 30 Rock, it can be a little bit intimidating given the history. Given it was still a relatively new, uh, new station and given the experiences you've already had, I imagine the acclimation process was a lot easier. No, you know what's so funny? It, it was the opposite. It was much harder yeah. because I was coming from a place where I felt, you know, if you look at the uh, ratings or like networks, right? Like you're like Channel 2, <clears> Channel <throat> 4. Really right now, I guess Channel 7 is like the highest and Channel yeah. 4 and Channel 7 sort of du duke it out. But at that time, News Channel 4 was like Chuck and Sue. And it was like, um, you know, like the I don't want to say like the romantic days of, of television, but I mean, people were really tuning in at 5, 6 and 11. And there were diehard, certainly much more than there is now. And so I was coming from a place where I had already met and worked with amazing talent. I, I had been um, mentored by an amazing managing editor, Phil O'Brien, who is just, even to this day, just a really great guy and so smart and so many wonderful things to like teach about news and writing and that kind of stuff. And when I walked into New York one, I remember thinking like, is this place rinky dink? Like, is this, you know, the graphics were different, right? Like news channel four was so polished. I remember like um, at, new, at New York one at the assignment desk, because the way New York one is designed, it's really to dis like uh, cover the city like a blanket. So like anytime there's like a BNN or something on a pager um, on, on the scanner, they're like logging it, they're putting it into, you know, this assignment grid, and then they're calling P NYPD or, D you know, DCPI, or they're calling um, the fire department press office, or they're but they're calling over everything. And the, it was the opposite. When I was at Channel 4, it was like, ah, eh, we don't have to call about that. That means no, you know, there was so much more because first of all, it was tri-state. So it wasn't super local the way New York one was. And that was an adjustment. That was actually probably the biggest adjustment for me. It was something that I, that I came to really love about my experience in New York one. And even to this day about local news, like I think people really, really do. I do really believe that people want to see what's happening in their neighborhoods and their street, like what's happening on the corner. And they want someone to explain that or some quirky little thing that's happening near where they live. But that's very different from what was happening where I had sort of been raised in my first year in news, which was to be the sort of macro picture. And then I was sort of thrust into this micro um, picture image of, of local news. And it was, I was, I did have a lot of the beginning where I was like, why are we doing this again? Like rolling my eyes about it. And, and, you know, it was, it was definitely an adjustment. It definitely was an adjustment. It was fun, but it was an adjustment. Well, that's what I love about not only New York One, but News 12. You know, Jessica Cunnington's another good friend of mine. She's at NBC4 now, and, and she does great work over there. And she was at News 12, the Bronx, for many, many years. Because the thing about it is that, and I have the same feeling down here in New Haven, like in a given neighborhood, especially in a city that large, like where you're at in New York, you know, they don't, most stations at least, they don't come there unless something big has happened, you know, or happening, mm -hmm. you know. So to get that small, as you just said, quirky story, it's like, hey, that's us, you know, you know, we're not forgotten. And that's, I think that's really one of the main things journalism should be about, not forgetting the people you're covering because you're one no, of them. And yeah, and I think that's what makes people like, I mean, even I don't, I'm not at New York One anymore, but I can't tell you how many people see me and, and still tell me their quirky little, you know, tidbit of whatever. And or how many other reporters I've met in the course of my time working as a Staten Island reporter who are like, <laughs> oh, we saw your story about whatever. And then that, you know, people have, have um, picked up on something that I found um, because I'm, I was the, the person who was still, you know, out here doing the stories. I was, I was the one who, who cared about the ultra local thing that wouldn't necessarily get played citywide. Um, right. You know, and I, I thought, I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good in that. There's a lot of value in that. I think when you look at the way local news works and stuff like that. Yeah, I hope it's not becoming a lost star, but I think with the crop of reporters coming up and this, the focus not really changing, even now with technology and the advent of like Citizen App being able to keep track of it, I think it's something that will only grow with time. So 2001, you know, when I was originally curating research for you and I was looking all over the place to find tidbits that might help me not look like an idiot tonight, which to this point I haven't done yet, but give it time, it'll happen. Um, you know, I think you were down on Canal Street that awful day and uh, you were up close and personal. You know, and, and you're witnessing people fleeing, you're witnessing all these firefighters, police officers, some of whom sadly ran into their deaths yeah. um, without hesitation. You know, for you, given 
your connection to the department. You know, I'm sure you knew your father's colleagues who had perished in this attack. You're 2001, you were 2002. How tough was that emotionally? So um, my experience on 9-11, um, I had worked at New York One. Um, I think I had been trained to shoot. I was an intern there for a year, my senior year after I left Channel 4. And I took a little time off after I graduated and um, then started full time at New York One. And so I was trained on the camera. And at the time, they were obviously the much bigger cameras than what we what you see now. They were much bigger, heavier, the batteries, like the whole thing weighed like 25 pounds. It's like a boom um, box. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were good. They're good cameras. We still have some of them. But um, but they, it was just much. And the tripod, the whole thing was like a 50 pound lift. Um, and that morning I was um, assigned to be in at 6 a.m. Uh, to cover Mark Green voting in the primary um, on the Upper East Side. And so I got to work. It was a beautiful day. It's, you know, the story that we've heard a thousand times. Went to get Mark Green voting at 6.30 or whatever. Got the shot. Came back to the office. Was sitting at a computer when one of these Simon Enters ran over and said, um, there's a fire at the World Trade Center. You got to go. And we said, okay, I was with another girl and um, a courier, somebody who's just like kind of a driver that we used once in a while. And we were on the West Side Highway and we saw the second plane hit the South Tower. And at that point, the guy that I was with was like an older man and he started crying and he was like, this is not, this is not right. And so we wound up, you know, getting as far south as we could, parking the car and then moving over. Um, and I think we got closer than Canal Street, um, because I know that at one point we were close enough that if you put the macro extend on the camera, um, I was able to see people jumping. And I can I can actually assure my name is Amanda, I could close my eyes right now and I can still see that. And um, it's amazing what your mind does to you in those situations, because I and I've said this a million times before, I don't I don't know that the thought ever occurred to me that those people weren't going to make it. Um, because it was, it was the, oh my, the, the sheer horror of, of the idea that whatever they were experiencing in there was so bad that they would jump from 100 plus, uh, stories is, is, is unfathomable, especially in the moment when you're, when you're watching it and then you're recording it. And then, um, anyway, we wind up doing some of that, uh, getting some of that. And, and then, um, then there was a rush of police officers. There was the imminent collapse. There was a cloud of smoke and, and we ran and, um, the days we went, we made it back to 42nd street. We were all covered in everything. Um, I had like, I don't know, 60 messages on my voicemail because nobody could get in touch with me because cell phone service was so crazy. And, um, yeah, you know, my dad, uh, my godfather was Billy Lake. Um, he was in rescue too, and, and he was killed on nine 11. Um, a, a kid that I went to college with, who was a very, very nice boy, um, Nick Brandamarty. Um, he was working on for KBW on the 101st floor or something. He just started his career, like worked, moved into an apartment in Hoboken. It was so personal for me. It really was so personal for me. Um, not only just because of, you know, I just, I, it, I, I, I live, I love the city. I, 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 you know, I'm like a New Yorker through and through and, and all of that was so, it was just so personal. And um, like I said, I tried to take the LSAT and my heart just wasn't in it because um, so much of the reporting that I was doing, and I wasn't even really like officially reporting by them, but I was I was out and I was a photographer. Um, so much of it was, um, it was all 9-11. It was three, four, I don't think until 2004, it wasn't my, own, my only focus. And, it, and that was in large part levied by my relationship with the fire department because my dad had just recently retired and so many people had been um, killed, but there were so many connections and it was much easier for me to interact with family members when they knew that I was essentially one of them. And um, I think that provided them a lot of comfort. And certainly for me, um, it gave me a lot of, uh, a way to alleviate some of my survivor guilt, which I definitely felt. Um, yeah. So yeah, the 9-11 is a tough, I know, you know, 20, even 20 years I had just this past year, I felt like, oh gosh, like I was grateful that I worked for the fire department on 9-11 because I felt like it gave me a chance to close the circle on something that had been so important and like define so many facets of my life. So, yeah. I, I interviewed Bob Galeone recently who worked with Billy Lake and Rescue 2. And he, you know, Billy, Billy I, I've seen clips of him on YouTube, you know, as part of the, the show, The Bravest. He was a hilarious guy. And yeah, what he was a great like a fire firefighter, right? Like he's like yeah. the quintessential. If you look at, you know, Harley Davidson fights the bike and the, you yeah. know, the motorcycle and, and the, you know, he just was all in, right? Um, yeah, but absolutely. he was my dad's very best friend, and um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it yeah. was a loss. Now, this, 
the stories that I, and actually Mike Milner from Rescue 4 is in the chat. So hi, hi, Mike. He was a previous guest on the Best, uh, Best the Bravest, Volume 9 interviews with the FDNY's Elite. You know, the, the, there are a lot of stories that my PD friends and my FD friends on this show have told me. But, you know, the ones that stick out for me is, um, one of them at least, is I'll, I'll never forget my friend Kevin Barry from the Bomb Squad, who was a volunteer out in the Wontaw Fire Department, telling me, you know, he was on the corner with his partner, Detective Michael Mixon, another Staten Island guy. And they're looking up. And they see these emergency service cops coming down. And one of them is John Delara. And Kevin had been in ESU prior to the bomb squad, as a lot of bomb squad guys were. And they lock eyes. They knew each other. And John just goes as if to say, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. And Kevin yeah. says, well, I've been there. And that was the last time he ever saw John. You know, John yeah. did not make it that day. So it's just a lot of stories like that that, as you say, make it personal. And I love that op-ed so much that you wrote in the Daily News because no. it was so visceral and it was so, so raw in that, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years can pass. But to quote my friend Bill Ryan in the chat, it's always going to feel like yesterday. And yeah, that's really like the rub of it, right? Like it's like, uh, and I thought I had that same thought when I was, we were at St. Pat's this year on 9-11 on and I was thinking like, goodness, this is not, there's, I mean, there's so, there's such real raw emotion um, and it gets me every time. It gets me every time because I'm, I'm in it, you know, like I, it gets me every time. Um, it doesn't get, it doesn't seem like it gets easier. I mean, I think people it's sort of just, be, I, I feel not even as a, as a personal, you know, as, as entrenched as some others, but I feel like it's just become part of the fabric of who I am. You know, that like right. my experiences that, that day, the way it shaped, my, <clears throat> that definitely shaped the way I reported. I felt like it was always so important to be a person first and a reporter second. So if you can see that someone was clearly in, distra in distress or uncomfortable, like you need to speak to somebody like a person, you know, like, and not shove a microphone in someone's face just because you think it's better for your story. Like I'd rather not do the story than, than be the, you know, the jerk with the, the annoying question, you know, if you can clearly see yeah. that someone's in some kind of, yeah. And I think that that really, that really did that for me. No, even before, anytime I get an FD or a PD guest on, I always ask them before, can I ask you about that day? Because some people understandably just don't want to talk about it. I'm like, that's fine. We don't have to. But if they do, well, then I'll try to, in a delicate way, get the story. Because for me, I was one years old that day, so I don't have a vivid recollection of my, of, of my own. But through hearing the stories, if you like you said earlier, if you close your eyes, you can see yourself right there as if you lived it through them, of course. So, you know, m moving on covering Staten Island and not only covering Staten Island, but covering the FDNY. I think what's so interesting about you, and you didn't just do FDNY stories, obviously you did a lot of other things, is that we know the police reporter. Newspapers have them. Television has crime reporters. You know, I've interviewed John Miller previously. That was his background. I had Rocco Paris Gandola from the Daily News a little while ago. Same thing. But you don't see too many fire reporters. You know, it's, it's such a great disparity. And I kind of, you can kind of see why the police has certain powers the fire department doesn't have. But besides the obvious reason, what would you attribute the lack of, for lack of a better way to ask the question, of FDNY reporters as compared uh -huh. to NYPD reporters too? Well, it's funny. I pitched it like a million times when I was at the, at New York one and I was, and it was the response that I was always given was like, there's not enough, right? Like there's not enough. Meaning, um, you know, the PD is an easy thing to cover every single day because there's always, unfortunately, always going to be like another crime story, right? Or another law enforcement policy or, or for that matter, another court case that might be relatively in interesting that you can sit on and, and do a story about the fire department. You know, there's, there's big fires. Certainly there, there are less now than there were, but there, there are always, Unfortunately, there are always fires, um, um, but not sometimes a fire is just a fire. And um, there, maybe there's an opinion that there's not a lot of news in that. You know, I've noticed it now and I noticed it as a reporter, but like um, you don't always get TV or, or news crews to a fire. <laughs> if, unfortunately, if it's not a fatal fire or if it's not a fire that involves, you know, multiple dwellings or multiple um, structures, you know, sometimes a fire is just a fire. Um, I, I always made the argument that, um, and I, you know, my background is also in in, um, in public policy, um, and that any agency is worth having someone who can understand the inner workings of it because it will improve your, your reporting so much, right? To understand, you know, the FDNY is paramilitary, so you know there's um, there's some, you know, its organization chart is a little bit different than, you know, if you went to like Department of Transportation or some other uh, C agency. I always made the, the argument that like, if I can understand that, you know, then I would be given access to, and I did understand that, but 
you know, if you would be given access to, you know, sometimes a feel good story, but then you also put yourself in a situation where you are well sourced. So you get a story, um, you know, that other people won't. I mean, that happened to me a do like dozens of times, but I, I just, I, I just, it always went back to like, we don't think there's enough. You might have a really good fire story once every two weeks or once a month or something, but it's not enough. So you should just stick to your Staten Island thing. And yeah. And so I kind of did, you know, I, I mean, I, I sort of, I was pretty mad about it. For, I think I was mad about it for a while because I just felt like I was being wasted. Um, right. But my talents were being like wasted. But I mean, I, you know, I, I did enough good, really good stories that I, that I was like, all right, well, I can just, at least I can, at least I have that. I mean, I have report for Mention Company 82 by the late Dennis Smith right in front of me. And I got the chance to speak with Dennis before his death uh, earlier this year. And if you read the book, and I'm sure you have, I'm definitely sure your father and your brother have, because that book is like the definitive book on the fire service, as you know. Mm -hmm. There's so much, you know, and I, I, that, that logic that you just described by certain newsrooms, it couldn't be further from the truth. The fire beat, the day in the life of a New York City firefighter is perhaps the most interesting day in the life that you can track. Because there's so much, and that's not including the Special Operations Command. I mean, imagine you're in Rescue 1 in Manhattan. You're in Rescue 2 like Billy Lake was, or our friend Mike Milner in Rescue 4. You're in one of the squads that's part of SOC. Imagine the day in the life of those guys. Imagine a tour with those guys, you know. And there is stories like involving the union sometimes that are of substantial interest that I feel like, I guess in a good way for the rank and file of the FDNY, it's easier because the media microscope is not as heavy. But at the same time, you run the risk, and it is a double-edged sword, and tell me if you agree, of missing out on those really good stories. You got to find the balance, right? Because I don't think that, and what I know from like working in the in the press office now is like we we definitely wouldn't even allow anybody the kind of access that would make a reporter sort of drool, right? Like if I wanted to follow around, you know, Bob Hernandez from wherever I at rescue what whichever, like it would be a small act. It would be, it would take it would be a heavy lift for me to get the access and to <laughs> there would be all sorts of. Um, I mean, first of all, there's like, there's concerns about, um, there's safety concerns there, you know, there's a lot of stuff that go that goes into it. Um, and so, um, you know, but the other part is if, you know, you can cultivate relationships with people with reporters that you begin to trust, and then you do give them that, that story. I mean, that happened to me as a reporter and I, and I do that even in my role now where, um, if I think that there's something that should be out there that you can, you know, find the right, um, home for it and for somebody that you trust can do it. And, and, um, but I mean, even to, to that point, we don't really have news stories necessarily that, um, are certainly that are not manufactured, um, from our office every single week. So, you know, sometimes it's nice when it's quiet in the press, you know, when, when yeah. there's not a lot, right. Like there's sometimes it's ni nice when there's not a lot going on. Um, cause I don't know. I don't, I don't really subscribe all press is good press. I don't necessarily agree with that. No. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, the, the, so you do need that break because everybody needs, especially after the last couple of years, you need time to recharge your battery. So if it's a quiet day, not only can it you know be an easy day in the newsroom, but you might get that feel good story. Like you were talking about earlier, you know, when I spoke with Paul Hassig and he was telling me that one time they got a horse out of a stable and I guess it was a slow day because the horse had been stuck in a the chute. They came out, all the news trucks were there. Yeah. Instead of going to some tragic shooting or some accident or whatever, or some political scandal, we're talking about a horse that we save from a shoot. So there is that, as you said earlier, there is that balance. So I'll shift it now to, and we're talking with Amanda Farinacci here in the Mike Haven podcast. She's the uh, current FDNY press secretary. Happy to have her here. And for those of you in the chat, either from LinkedIn or from YouTube, if you have a question for her, uh, fire away and I'll make sure I get to it. Uh, you don't want to ask me anything because I'm not nearly as interesting as she is. So when you talk about Staten Island, I mentioned, of course, you know, people kind of forget about it. There's other boroughs. Manhattan is where everything happens. Brooklyn's the largest borough, so it gets unique coverage. The Bronx, you know, we got the Yankees down there. We'll talk about them a little bit later. But I feel like Staten Island's kind of neglected to an extent. So being the Staten Island reporter, what was your mission in terms of not only getting the good stories out there, but showcasing, well, the very best of the borough? Well, I think um, it, I think my, my role, I took my job as a standout reporter very seriously. And I, and I, I became, and I still am, I think in large part, a strong, a staunch defender of the borough, because I feel like people who oftentimes have never been here, have a lot of opinions about who work here and what this place is. And that just bothers me. Um, I think that um, my mission in covering Staten Island was always for me to find a piece of information about my borough 
that would appeal to someone in Kingsbridge in the Bronx or, uh, you know, in, in, um, in Forest Hills in Queens or whatever, like, you know, the Lower East Side. How do you find the story about, um, you know, I used to like think, oh, I, you know, someone up the block for me is complaining that there's a crack in her cement in front of her house. And so that's not really an interesting piece of information. But what is interesting is how people are irritated by the fact that they need to go to city government to get a crack in their cement fixed or that the city, you know, DOT is the person who, or that, you know, some, somehow that somehow there's city and go city government engaged or involved in what, what their issue is and how do they navigate that people across the city love to talk about the things that happen in their house, like in their neighborhoods. And everybody understands what that means. Like if you post something about um, perfect example, when it snows, if the sanitation doesn't come up, come and pick up your, your garbage or your recycling, people go insane. They go literally insane. It's not just here on Staten Island, but it's literally in any neighborhood. You go outside, you see piles of trash. You're like, oh, these guys, they can't be bothered to pick up their truck. And people flip out. So if you go outside and you see this on your Staten Island street or whatever, and you put that story on TV, all of a sudden people are like, oh, that's happening on Staten Island. That's happening in my neighborhood too. And then all of a sudden, maybe Staten Island isn't such a foreign place to you because you can understand why people are angry about these little annoying things. On a larger scale, I think I learned a lot more about um, Staten Island and its relationship like sort of to the rest of the country during the, the last election, just because Staten Island is always about 20 years behind the city um, just in terms of like advancing things, which is kind of a crazy thing, even that I'm saying it and I'm championing the borough. Um, we're always like a little bit slow, a little bit delayed, like, oh, maybe we'll do that on Staten Island in a couple of years. But certainly I think that, um, and I don't want to get like into all the politics here, but like certainly on election night, there was a party, a Trump party. People were like, you know, losing their minds that he won and everywhere else in the city, he was in mourning. But that slice of Staten Island was emblematic of what was happening across the country and everybody sort of dismissed it. And then all of a sudden here it was. So I, I think that it's a big mistake for people to just sort of blow this borough off as a place that means nothing and is just the forgotten borough and people are idiots because it's, it's completely not true. And um, beyond the fact that there's interesting stories, there, there are great businesses. There's, you know, it's a borough of small businesses. It's people who just want to have a nice quality of life, who have families, who, you know, want good things for their kids, just like everybody else. Um, and it was always my pleasure and my honor to be able to tell those kinds of stories, to just make people understand that like, there's more to us here than just, you know, you saying, go back to the dump and, and move on. I think that's really just insulting on so many levels. Right, you know, and, and to your point earlier, it hit close to home when you mentioned sanitation because my brother-in-law works for the City of Public Works here in New Haven. So Victor, if you, I know he's watching. If you don't pick up my trash next time, I'm telling Amanda. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, he does a great job. Shout out to Victor. But, you know, it is interesting because not only that, but you think about the residents too. Where are they coming from? Well, some of them are native Staten Islanders. But some of them are coming from Brooklyn. Some of them are coming from the Bronx. You know, boroughs where they had a very difficult, strenuous life at times, and they bring that story to Staten Island, profile that person. What can they tell you? What can you learn? You don't want to miss out because as a result, you could shut it out as a dump. And I would hate that. Like on Law and Daughter, the character Mike Logan, Detective Mike Logan, he got banished to Staten Island. I'm like, well, why, why we got to paint Staten Island that light? You know, I can't, you, you can't knock it until you've been there. Right. You know? Right. And I mean, I, I think you could probably make the, the argument like there's, there's bad apples and in every bunch, right? Like, so I'm not going to say that there have not been some things that have um, been a little bit that have added fuel to the fire of uh, public opinion about Staten Island. Obviously, there's, um, you know, but I don't, I just think that there's really more to, than it meets the eye. And I think like, if anybody just paid even a little bit of attention, you know, you mentioned people move here from Staten, from, from Manhattan, from Brooklyn. Um, people were like, it's a, it was a for, for, I mean, now housing prices are crazy, but like it's affordable, you know, there's, there's a feel to it in some areas. Like you can have a nice house. You can, um, you have a little piece of grit, you know, a yard, a little grass or whatever. Um, and feel like you're in a community, you know, there's, there's a, a big sense of community, I think here. And, um, I mean, there's other issues. <laughs> there's a million other issues. There's lack of public transportation. There's, you know, all of this other stuff, uh, expensive tolls, all, you know, all of the other, annoying things but mostly if you if you try to carve out a niche for yourself here i think you could be happy my only beef with staten island is that they got rid of the staten island yankees name um so i'm gonna i'm gonna need Congrats. to throw hands with somebody yeah yeah 
Yeah. Well, the fairy hawks are coming. So I, you know, we got to hope that there's something there. And I mean, that's, that's another thing, like, right? Like it's, it's a beautiful stadium. It's like crazy that there's even been an issue there, right? Attracting people because it's just nice. Like if you go to a ball yeah. game at night at the St. George, like at the, at the um, St. George ballpark, like <clears throat> um, it's just nice. It's just a nice night at the, at the, at the field. It's just a nice place to be. Yeah, exactly. I miss the ballpark, you know, uh, as, as so note to MLB, the fine folks in Manhattan, please get your stuff together so we can have a season. Thank you very much. Uh, so I can watch the Yankees take about 15 more years off my life. Uh, so that being said, <laughs> uh, yeah. I want to accelerate ahead to 2012 with Sandy because you were there for that. And Staten Island, I think, well, Jersey got hit particularly hard, but looking strictly at New York as opposed to the rest of the tri-state area, Connecticut got hit hard in certain spots, too. Staten Island did take its its fair share of a beating with that storm. So yeah. having lived there by that point for so many years, obviously being a reporter covering the borough, um, much like 9-11, although a little bit different because this wasn't a terror attack, the emotional toll of it for you personally, and of course, profiling those stories with delicacy and respect. Walking that line, what was that like for you? Well, um Sandy was crazy. I was actually, my backstory with Sandy is I, I got married on November 2nd. Sandy was October 30, October 29th. Um, I got married four days later. My wedding was almost canceled. Um, there was a leak in the church caused by Sandy. Everybody, there was no gas, right? Like, um, uh, so half of my wedding didn't get there because they didn't have gas in their cars to get to where they needed to go. Um, I had been working around the clock covering, um, the storm and its aftermath. So I barely knew that any of this was happening. Uh, wound up having a really fun wedding for the people who were able to make it. But, um, I went on my honeymoon, came back and was sort of just told, listen, this is, uh, the damage is extensive and just go find some stories literally every night before I had no stories set up, which was kind of different from what I had the way I had been reporting before it was, this was really just um, nitty gritty reporting. Like I was me in my car with my camera knocking on doors and saying to people like, tell me what happened to you, what happened to you. And um, again, as I, I did experience after nine 11, um, that was really gratifying for me to be able to just tell the story. Um, and, and then it sort of turned into a whole thing where um, I just became that person who was always doing the Sandy stories. And it was, it was kind of by accident. It was just because I felt like, how come no one's asking, like, why is this still an issue? Like, how come nobody's helping or how come this program stinks or how come, um, you know, why are we still in this so many years later? How could we do this better? Why aren't we talking about this uh, more? And I was happy and I'm still very, very proud to have um, been able to cover that issue in that way. I, I think that there's very few times in your life as a reporter where you're, you're able to really um, report the heck out of something. And I'm, I'm very proud that I was able to do that with, with that, because I do think, especially climate change stuff, um, the prevalence of these kinds of storms, the things that people need to get, they need to care. They need to care. And, and you need somebody to shine a light on that. I think for sure. Absolutely. Uh, last note on, on your time in the field before I get to the FDNY uh, aspect of your, of your career, which is equally interesting. I don't want to leave tonight without profiling is when you get to that point where you have, 15, 16, 17 years in the field, you get to that point where you've seen a lot. Maybe you haven't seen everything, but you've seen 95% of it, that's for sure. And you've had some unique experiences as you've recounted throughout this uh, conversation that I've immensely enjoyed. When you're trying to figure out a way to stay creative and stay motivated, I guess when you got to the backstage of your time at New York One, tell me about the things that kept you going when so many reporters might feel jaded or cynical by that point. I guess it's just like, what do you think about, what do you think reporting is, right? Like I, I know that everybody who has a phone now thinks that they're reporters, right? Like Citizen App or even just like I'm putting a Snapchat or I'm doing a Facebook Live and everybody just thinks like I've got, and I, and it's a product of, you know, what, what we are as a society now, which is like we want our news right now, right now, right now, right now. But for me, it always goes back to like the power of the written word and the idea that what people say really matters and that, um, you know, I didn't, I never got tired of it. I, I just never, and I still even, I miss some things about my, my, my former job. I don't miss everything, but um, I do think that the only way to keep it fresh is to really just keep it fresh, right? Like to, when you're in a rut with uh, trying to find a story or whatever, you got to go back to basics, which is like, go and I used to drive to, especially towards the end, uh, the last probably five years or so of my, of my, my career, uh, 
my time in New York one, I really was a reporter who was, um, I don't know if the, I never really used this word, but like intrepid in the way that I just would be like, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive and I'm going to see what, what I find out, what I figure out. And more often times than, than not, I was able to just find something that, um, you know, you, you think like people who are in the neighborhood, you drive, drive around, you see something you haven't seen before you ask a question and that then you, you, sometimes you get an answer and there's a story. Sometimes you ask a question that, and someone says, what do you mean? That's, you know, something that's been there for forever. And you're an idiot for asking that other times you step in it and, and you're like, what a great story. I'm so happy I did this, but you don't do that. You don't have those kinds of experiences by, by, you know, writing things on social media or like tweeting out, you know, give me your, your tips or whatever you have to find them. I do think you have to find them. And I think that's a little something that's a little missing in reporting now is like, there's not that much like, you know, door knocking and, and sort of poking as much as before. And it's, it's, it's really just a product of like the demand for news, right? Like a constant demand to have something, to churn something out. You don't always get the opportunity to spend a day kind of driving around and figuring it out. If you have to turn a package, you have to turn a package. So um, that, that, that I think is the only thing that really keep, can keep you going because it's like, what makes you curious? You have to ask yourself every day, like, what, do I, what am I curious about? How can I figure that out and, and try to take it there? It's really a gumshoe style of reporting. I know in the old days they were referred to detectives in the prior era as gumshoe detectives because they would walk around exactly that in a different capacity looking for answers. And right. gumshoe reporters, too, you, you see some of that. And I think the current crop is still motivated, but technology giveth and technology taketh the way, like you said. Right. Uh, right. So, yeah, uh, that segues now into 2021. You leave New York one at the end of 20, you had a little bit of time off, which I imagine was nice, get to recalibrate, spend more time with your family. But then, you know, you get this opportunity to go to the FDNY. And when I read the article at the time, the New York Daily News of, you know, your hiring being announced, it was a no brainer for you. So getting there and, you know, seeing the functions of the press office and, and, and getting to work with great people like Tommy Richardson, like Dan Nigro, take me through it first, the process to get there. And of course, your day to day in the FDNY. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had, I left New York one. I wasn't really thinking about getting a job, um, right away. I, I, actually was sort of avoiding it because I was like, well, what am I, what do I even really want to do? What, how am I going to do this? Um, and so I got a phone call like in the end of March um, from my current boss who I worked with for years before. He also worked at New York one at one time. And then 20 minutes later, I got a phone call from someone else. And then an hour later, I got a call from the so our uh, communications director and everybody was like, so what do you think? And I was sort of like, come on, you know, like <laughs> I was enjoying my sort of hangout, like figure my life out kind of time. And I came home and I told my husband, I said, oh, you know, these guys all called me and, and um, they really want me to take this job. And I was like, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. And then I then I kind of paused and I was like, what am I, an idiot? Like, of course, I'm going to take this job. I mean, I have it was like a no brainer. You know, um, I had sort of joked when I went to uh, grad school. For public, I went to get my master's in public administration. And I, even when I was in grad, grad school, I said to people who asked me, why are, you in, why are you in grad school? And I was like, well, I don't really want to be like 50 something standing on a street corner mm -hmm. telling people that it's snowing. Like that just seems like something that I would outgrow. Do I love reporting? Of course, but like just, you know, what the tra trajectory was. And I was like, ah, I, you know, I, I know if I want to, um, you know, I'm always interested in city, city government. I love the fire department. I don't know. <laughs> If I want to do anything in of any you know substance, I'll have to have a managerial um, master's anyway. So I was like, ah, I'll probably just. And I said it like a million times. I was like, I'll probably just go work for the fire department, whatever. And I just kind of blew it off. And then there was like on a like a platter, and I was like, Ugh. and so it it was it was sort of serendipitous, but also just kind of amazing that it worked out the way that it did because um, it it's, it is in many ways a very natural extent, extension for the, the kind of stuff I was doing before because I was so connected. Um, there was re really very little transition for me because um, I haven't, I already speak the language. I already know I have enough institutional knowledge for my coverage um, from New York One. And also just like, you know, my brother is still active. Um, many of, I have many friends who are still ha active. Several of my girlfriends are married to firefighters. Um, and, and it just, it was, it's just, I hate to say like, it's just been easy, but it's just been easy. And, and I feel like that's a blessing because I enjoy it and, and it's fun and it really doesn't feel like work. And I didn't really, I wasn't fully confident that that would happen again because I'd ha always had that kind of career at New York one where it didn't feel like work. It just was like kind of fun. And, and this is kind of an extension of that. And I feel really grateful for that. So it's, it's been a good fit. 
to your point about covering snowstorms, I don't envy the reporters that have to do that. I mean, <laughs> if you send me out there, I'd be miserable. Mike, how is it out there? Brick, back to you, Bob. You know, yeah. it's just I, I that that I've never understood, but I kind of understand. It's like I can look out the window and I can see it's pretty bad. Why do I need someone that you're sending out into the freezing cold and five inches at minimum right. of snow to tell me that? Right. But I mean, again, there's a time and a place for that. But I mean, it, it, once yeah. you've done it, you've done it. You don't need to do it. You know, once you've done it, you've done it. I'll leave it there. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, everybody thinks about, you know, DCPI of the NYPD and the magnitude of press uh, volume that they get and between requests and whatnot. It's it's chaos over there, organized chaos, if you will, day in and day out. But I imagine, you know, it's relatively the same at the FDNY. So many requests. I mean, think about it. This is such a recognizable name. When you think of the fire service, it's the most recognizable fire department in the country, certainly in the world. And many would say I'm among them. It's the greatest fire department in the world. So managing those requests, including this annoying guy right here that wanted to interview the chief of department, uh, how is that for you and, and how do you balance it out? Um, you know, I think it's, it's sometimes it's timeliness. Sometimes it's um, public safety messaging. Sometimes it's um, a nugget of good news. Sometimes it's managing bad news. Sometimes it's all of the above, right? Um, and I think there's a little bit of like a rhythm to that because you don't often get all of those things at once. Obviously, you know, unfortunately the busiest time is before 9-11, like this past, I started in June and our, our, the months leading up to that were just like silly busy just in terms of like, you know, cause you get so much international press and requests for, and you're doing the same, you know, interviews and you're giving the same responses over and over again. Um, but you know, we, we get the same, I, I mean, I think PD gets probably, and I, I say this like cautiously, I think their requests may be a little more annoying than ours are right. Like just because they're getting, do you have a response to this? Or if there's a police involved shooting or um, the fire department is great because more often than not, the, the news is good. Right. Like people want to say, oh, this guy is a hero or, you know, there's there's bad stories. There are definitely bad stories, but mostly they're good ones. Right. Like, right. you know, you you're in an emergency. You call us. We come and everyone's happy. You know, you're upset, yeah. whatever. But people are people are rescued. They're they're able to move on, whatever. Like, you know, that makes the job a lot easier than I think. And actually, I've, I've said this, too. Like, I don't necessarily know that I could go work at another city agency and deal with like the headaches that come with some of the issues that, that are involved in some of the other agencies. It, it just, it just wouldn't be as fun. I don't think. I can, I can kid John Miller because he's a friend of mine, but I could have sworn his hair was black about 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> ever since he took that DCPI job, but he does a great job and he's a great guy. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a full head of white now, but you know, as you said, so many of the stories are good, even with that tragedy in January with the Bronx fire, that unfortunately claimed so many lives. One of the best things to come out of that was that photo of that firefighter holding that young baby, taking yeah. her out of that. And that's so much of what goes in day in and day out. And you get to chronicle that. And it's it has to be on the drive back to Staten Island at the end of a long day. It has to be such a rewarding feeling. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's nice. And and I and I and I've known this my whole life, but I see it in my job every day. Like, there's just a lot of good people. It, you know, there's just a lot of good. It, it's any really any first responder. Like, you you're taking a job in which you've agreed to, essentially put your life on the line for someone else, right? Like, in service to this city and to your neighbors, to your community. Um, there's nothing small about that. That's like it's just wonderful. And so if you meet people who are inherently helpers. And you're able to shine a light on them and say, I mean, the, the, the photo you're talking about is is a perfect example. So we reached out to the firefighter and he wanted no part of, um, you know, he didn't he didn't want the spotlight on him because there were so many. First of all, there was so much tragedy um, that day. And also, um, you know, there were 200 members that, you know, EMS and, and, and fire personnel there and everybody was part of, you know, a synchronized rhythmic response. And. I'm making it sound a lot more organized than it than it really is. But you know what I mean? Like the, you know, yeah. and, and um you find those kinds of things all the time. And that's the beauty of it. It's that is that you have the opportunity to meet just like good people who are doing good things. And if you can shine a light on them, that's 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 great. That's great. Yeah. They they are they are the very best and bravest that New York City has to offer. And I've always said, you know. If you it, it, walk by a firehouse, walk by a police precinct, those are heroes. And by extension, and I've said this before as well. If you want to see the, the uh, especially if you want to especially see, I should say, the definition of a hero, go down to the FDNY headquarters in Brooklyn and by extension, one police plaza in Manhattan, take a look at the memorial wall and read those names. You know, those are heroes because on a moment's notice, not only did they take the job to put their life on the line, they gave up everything 
in most cases for somebody that they didn't even know, but they did it without hesitation. Uh, last question I'll ask before we get to the concluding segment is goals now at this stage. You're in such a great position in your career and in your life. What are you looking to accomplish? Uh, you know, I always want to leave something a little better off than the way I found it, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm having a nice time. I've, I have a good time at work. I, um, I hope to. I think what's nice about my job is that um, I work with mostly to, you know, I, I, our, our unit is pretty small, but I work with people who um, really uh, respect and value my opinion. And so um, <laughs> it's very nice to provide, I think, I think for everybody, it's nice for me to be able to share some of the institutional knowledge that I've picked up having, you know, been in the streets of New York City reporting for the last 20 years and now, you know, kind of explain. Um, I think that skill has been pretty valuable to the department so far, which is like, well, what's this reporter going to ask? And I'm always able to say, like, if it was me, I would do this. And if it was me, I would do that. Um, and that has been nice and gratifying to see. And so, I, you know, I, I, um, I have been able to do some writing um, with, with the department. And I, I just, you know, I feel like it's a strong place. It's, it's as strong a place as you'd want it to be for what it is. And, and I'm just like proud to be part of it. I'm, I'm happy and proud to be part of it. It feels, um, it feels appropriate for me. Before I get to the concluding segment, I, sorry, we were saying? No, no, that's okay. Before I get to concluding segment, I read you this from Dennis Smith's report from Engine Company 82. Now think of the constant turmoil of an inner city where the sirens of fire trucks fill the air like a turbulent wind, where computers project how many fires could occur today and how many people could be injured or killed. Think about the firefighters riding on those trucks and the questions they'll face at their destination. What is the construction of the building? How is the fire traveling? Are people trapped? Has someone been shot or knifed? Does it need to be cut loose from a mangled automobile? Has she had a heart attack or a drug overdose or an epileptic seizure, or is it simply a false alarm? These are the questions that determine life and death, and these are the firefighters I have written about, representative of every firefighter you've ever seen, met, or read about. They are regular human beings, like you or your neighbor, but something separates them from the norm, something I hope you'll discover in the pages of this book. In the end, what is most admirable about firefighters is their reliability. When they are called, they come. New York City. September 9th, 1998, the late, great Dennis Smith. It is now time for a concluding segment of the show. As I mentioned before, rapid fire, five hit run questions for me, five answers for me. Are you ready? All right. Let's see if I can do it. <laughs> and you can say pass if you want. First, if you could interview anybody dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oprah Winfrey. Um, <laughs> there you go. She's just great. I feel like she's the queen. Yeah. Second, favorite interview you've ever done? Uh, Bill Clinton. No, oh, really? Okay, that's pretty cool. Third, funny story you've ever covered. Oh, goodness. Okay, uh, I went to a, a civic association meeting and this guy was talking about his neighbor who was um, boarding a horse next to him. And I was like, wait, what? And he was like, yeah, come to my house tomorrow. There's a horse outside. And the guy, his neighbor had like built an outdoor stable and he did this impersonation of Mr. Ed, where he was like, Woo! on the thing. It was the funniest soundbite. I think, I think it could, you could put it like on a loop. And it was, <laughs> even now I'm like, and then when I did the story, like I said before, Staten Island sometimes deserves its bad rap. Um, this guy is like t on this, this horse, like, parading to a Dunkin' Donuts drive through on a horse like in Stapleton. It was hilarious and bizarre and also just like quintessential Staten Island. Like what happened? Like why? <laughs> yeah, that, would, that one sticks with me. That was fun. That was a fun one. Fourth, fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York City. God, there's so many. I don't know. You have to pick a borough. I, you know, if I went to school. You when can I went say to, multiple. Yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, Pasquale Rigoletto on Arthur Avenue is where I went when I was in college. We went there recently with my kids. I loved it. Um, I really like about a million restaurants on Staten Island. My uncle owns like four of them. We go to a bunch all the time. I, 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 I could talk for three hours about restaurants. I'm a person who likes to go out to eat. So I don't know. I don't know. Fifth and finally, what advice, given your experiences, what advice would you give anyone looking to enter your profession? Respect the power of the written word. Um, Strong writing, clear writing will get you very, very far. Um, take time to ask questions and observe. It's not about, you know, you being on TV. And also, most importantly, not even just my profession, but like figure out what you hate so you can figure out what you love. Because especially in some like a medium like TV, right, like um, there's so many options for what your job could look like. And you really need to know 
what you don't want to do if you're on shore. Like you might think, oh, TV is cool for me, whatever. But, you know, you could be producer, you could be a control room person, you could be in field, whatever. Um, the benefit of that is in knowing what you don't like, you figure out what you really love. And if you really love it, it will never feel like work. And then you'd be really lucky and really happy. There you go. Don't say goodbye yet. We'll sign off. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Uh, but before we say goodbye to the audience, any shout outs to anyone or anything you want to give? Nope. Just uh, thanks so much for watching. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. All right. My shout out as always to the audience. I'll shout you out in order. Of course, Raquel Pranzo, retired NYPD first grade detective Bill Ryan from Arson Explosion, retired NYPD Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, Mike Milner, retired FDNY firefighter from Rescue 4. My sister's here, of course. Thank you, Josh. Rick Martinez, retired NYPD Emergency Service Unit, Truck 3 in the Bronx, and uh, Ruth Ann Griffin. Thanks, guys. So uh, my next guest coming up next in the Mike New Haven podcast, he too answered the call like New York's bravest do, but he was a member of New York's finest for 13 years, and he was on the Violent Predator Task Force. Uh, so it'll be interesting talking with him. He's also was a baseball scout after his career in the PD ended. He's a businessman, uh, does consulting. He's really a jack of all trades. Sergeant Rick Van Leuven retired out of the NYPD, namely the Bronx, uh, will join me this Friday on the Mike the New Haven podcast. In the meantime, of course, on behalf of FDNY Press Secretary Amanda Farinacci, this has been Volume 13, The Best of the Bravest, interviews with the FDNY's elite. I'm Mike Colon. Have a great night, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.